Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. My email is sriklpm at gmail.com. Today we are going to talk about a very very interesting and fascinating topic the localization of Horner's syndrome. The localization of Horner's syndrome, cranial nerves part 18, oculomotor nerves part 4. In Horner's syndrome, the sympathetic dysfunction produces ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. The sympathetic system the sympathetic pathway originates from the hypothalamus and comes to the C8 T1. So this is known as the first order of the sympathetic pathway. The second order comes from the C8 T1. It goes and ascends up to the superior cervical ganglion. So this is known as the second order. The third order comes from the superior cervical ganglion, goes on the internal carotid artery and then joins the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and goes as the long ciliary nerve and supplies the pupillar, the dilator pupillae and causes the dilatation of the pupil. Note also that it goes and supplies the superior tarsal muscle. So, if it gets affected, it results in drooping of the eyelid and ptosis. So, the sympathetic dysfunction produces ptosis because the mullous muscle gets affected. It causes meiosis because the dilator pupillae gets affected. And it also causes anhydrosis because the sympathetic pathway at the bifurcation of the carotid artery not only goes on the internal carotid artery, but also the external carotid artery and supplies the a, innervation of the face for the sweating and therefore if that gets affected it causes anhydrosis so the sympathetic pathway there are three orders the first order from the hypothalamus to the c81 the second order from c81 to the superior cervical ganglion and the third order from the superior cervical ganglion to the dilator pupillae and if, the, and if it gets affected, then it causes ptosis, meiosis and anhydrosis. Right. So, we have the three orders also. So, lack of the sympathetic input to the accessory lid retractors results in ptosis the denervation of the Muller's muscle and apparent anophthalmosis because the lower lid muscle is also affected so it is known as inverse doses which causes anophthalmosis anophthalmus so anophthalmus the lower lid is frequently elevated 1 to 2 millimeters because of the loss of action of the lower lid accessory retractor that holds the lid down known as inverse ptosis. The resulting narrowing of the palpable fissure causes apparent anophthalmus. So Horner syndrome it causes that is the lack of sympathetic input causes ptosis, anophthalmus. Yeah now how do we differentiate the anisocoria from the Horner syndrome and the third nerve palsy using light and dark conditions. Very very important clinical concept differentiating anisocoria that is the inequality of pupil from Horner's syndrome that is a sympathetic dysfunction and the third nerve palsy that is the parasympathetic dysfunction using light and dark conditions just using light and dark condition we can differentiate the anisocoria that is the inequality of pupil whether it is because of the sympathetic dysfunction or whether it is because of the parasympathetic dysfunction so how do we differentiate very important clinical concept in Horner's syndrome, the small pupil dilates poorly in the dark. So, pupillary asymmetry is greater in the dark than in the light. It indicates Horner's syndrome. So, when there is inequality of the pupil during dark,
darkness the darkness sim- stimulates a sympathetic pathway and allows the pupil to dilate but in horner syndrome since the sympathetic is pathway is affected the darkness cannot sy- stimulate the sympathetic pathway and the pupil on that side cannot dilate so the anisocoria may be there in the normal light but during darkness when the pupil is supposed to dilate it does not dilate the other normal pupil dilates normally and therefore anisocoria increases in darkness so if the anisocoria increases in darkness that means it is sympathetic dysfunction and horner syndrome in contrast the third no palsy causes greater asymmetry in the light because of the inward pupils inability to constrict the bright light stimulates the parasympathetic pathway and causes the pupil to constrict so in the normal light there may be anisocoria but when there is bright light when the pupil is supposed to constrict because of the third nerve and parasympathetic dysfunction the bright light cannot stimulate the parasympathetic pathway and the pupil on that side will not constrict whereas the other pupil will normally constrict so the anisocoria increases in bright light it indicates parasympathetic dysfunction so anisocoria increasing in darkness is because of horner syndrome anisocoria increasing in bright light is because of the parasympathetic dysfunction there can be a normal physiologic anisocoria small difference in the size of the pupil on the two sides but then whether in darkness or in the light the difference remains the same so physiological anisocoria produces about the same degree of pupillary asymmetry in the light and dark so very fascinating concept just using light and dark conditions we can differentiate the anisocoria from the horner syndrome that is a sympathetic dysfunction and from the third nerve palsy that is the parasympathetic dysfunction so here is a wonderful uh, depiction of the differentiation of anisocoria from the horner and the third nerve palsy using light and dark conditions so on the left side you can see the etiologic factor on the other side you see the ambient light and then the strong light and the dark and the conclusion so if you see the physiological anisocoria in the ambient light also there is anisocoria but when there is a strong light both the pupils constrict and in, during darkness both the pupils dilate so there is a same relative asymmetry under all conditions same relative asymmetry and under all conditions is physiological anisocoria but we see the right horner syndrome in the ambient light there is anisocoria in strong light the pupils constrict because the parasympathetic pathway of the third nerves are intact but in the darkness since the sympathetic pathway is affected the normal pupil dilates but the but the side of the pupil where the sympathetic pathway is affected it cannot dilate so the asymmetry there is more asymmetry in the dark the abnormal pupil cannot dilate see here the abnormal pupil does not dilate and therefore the anisocoria has increased in darkness that suggests horner syndrome whereas if it is third nerve palsy again in ambient light there is anisocoria but in the strong light the normal pupil constricts whereas the pupil where there is a parasympathetic dysfunction of the third nerve does not constrict and therefore the anisocoria increases in the strong light but the darkness there is no asym- there is no asymmetry so the more asymmetry in the light the abnormal pupil cannot constrict so if there is more anisocoria in the strong light it indicates third nerve dysfunction the more anisocoria in the in the darkness it indicates the horner syndrome whereas the same relative asymmetry on all, under all conditions is physiological anisocoria right so i in the first slide i mentioned the first order neuron the second order neuron the third order neuron the first order neuron descends from the hypothalamus through the brain stem and upper cervical spinal cord that is till the cat1 so if there is a lesion anywhere the first order neuron gets affected example it traverses through the brain stem and therefore lateral medullary syndrome is a classic example of the first order neuron being affected in the horner syndrome so in the second order it is from the cat1 till the upper thoracic spinal cord 
So second order neuron lies in the intermediate lateral gray column of the CAT2 of the upper thoracic spinal cord that is the spinal center of budge. Axons arch over the apex of the lung and synapse in the superior cervical ganglion. So a classic example of the lesion of the second order neuron causing Horner syndrome is apical lung tumors. Whereas the third order neuron ascends from the superior cervical ganglion and continues to the pupillodilator a muscle on the internal carotid artery again a classic example of a lesion of the third order neuron is the internal carotid artery di dissection so we have the first order neuron from the hypothalamus to CAT2 the second order neuron from CAT2 to the superior cervical ganglion the third order neuron from the superior cervical ganglion to the pupillodilator muscle the classic example of the lesion causing first order neuron of the Horner syndrome is lateral medullary syndrome where the lesion is the medulla oblongata. The classic example of the lesion affecting the second order neuron is the apical lung tumor. The classic example of the lesion affecting the third order neuron is the internal carotid artery dissection. Yeah, now comes the very fascinating topic how to localize the localize the the three orders of the Horner syndrome localization of Horner syndrome to understand this we need to understand an important concept with the first and second order Horner syndrome the third order neuron is disconnected but intact and its terminal connections are sound and viable so with the first and second order Horner syndrome the third order neuron is disconnected but intact and its terminal connections are sound and viable but with the third order Horner syndrome, the final neuron in the pathway dies and its peripheral processes atrophy and disappear. So, if we know these uh, two concepts, now we can localize the Horner syndrome. The localization of Horner syndrome is done by two pharmacological uh, drugs, one by using cocaine and second by using hydroxyamphetamine. Cocaine confirms the Horner syndrome but does not localize the Horner syndrome whereas hydroxyamphetamine localizes the Horner syndrome. First, we need to confirm whether the Horner syndrome is present or not. So, how do we confirm? We confirm it by a drug called as cocaine. When we use cocaine, it blocks the reuptake of norepinephrine, increasing its effects and therefore, cocaine drops instilled into the eye dilates the normal pupil but not the pupil of Horner syndrome and confirms it but cannot localize it. So, cocaine dilates the normal pupil but cannot dilate the pupil of the Horner syndrome and therefore, when the cocaine does not dilate the pupil, it confirms the presence of Horner syndrome but it does not localize the Horner syndrome. So, confirmation of the Horner syndrome is done by cocaine. The localization of Horner syndrome is done by hydroxyamphetamine. Hydroxyamphetamine drops causes release of norepinephrine but only from intact nerve endings. So, if the third order neuron is intact as with the first or second order Horner syndrome, the pupil will dilate in response to hydroxyamphetamine. <coughs> but in a third order Horner syndrome, there are no surviving nerve endings in the eye to release norepinephrine and the pupil will fail to dilate. So, this is the uh, depiction of the localization of the Horner syndrome using cocaine and hydroxyamphetamine. So, when we put cocaine, it dilates the normal pupil, but it does not dilate the pupil of the Horner syndrome, whether it is first order, second order or third order. So, when we put cocaine, when there is no response, whether it is first order, second order or third order, it confirms Horner syndrome. But to localize Horner syndrome, we use hydroxyamphetamine. If the first order is affected or the second order is affected, hydroxyamphetamine still dilates the pupil because the third order is intact. But the moment the third order is also affected, when we put hydroxyamphetamine, it does not dilate the pupil. So, where if hydroxyamphetamine dilates the pupil, the lesion is in the first order or the second order. If it, dil if it does not dilate the pupil, it means the lesion is in the third order. So, two pharmacological substances we can use to confirm and localize Horner syndrome. First is cocaine. If the cocaine does not dilate the pupil, it confirms Horner syndrome. And second is hydroxyamphetamine. If dilates the pupil, it could be the lesion, could be the first order or second order. 
if it di does not dilate the pupil that lesion is in the third order so with just these two substances cocaine and hydroxyamphetamine we can localize the horner syndrome so these are the fascinating concepts of localization of horner syndrome the other fascinating neurology concepts i have put in a book called focused neurology uh, written by me dr s srinivas it is available online from all leading booksellers including amazon if interested it could be bought online so these are all the fascinating concepts of the sympathetic pathway the first order second order and third order and the honor syndrome and the localization of the honor syndrome if you have enjoyed listening to this lecture please like and share the video with your friends but please subscribe my youtube channel dr sinvas medical concepts and my web page dr sinvas concepts thank you bye